Uh, the young lady who's coming, come in at the right time because I was going to say something about her. I've got to be very careful. Ms. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Teling, another member of our parliament. There were two members of parliament today. We have four. You know, with, uh, the Mr. Lee Shishan is a member of parliament and Tim Teling. But Tim Teling has got one extra weapon. Our husband used to be our boss. He was the director of ISAS. He's no longer the director of ISAS. But he served us well. He gave us very valuable advice. And I'm very grateful to you, Selig, for coming today. And uh, I will now turn it to Radha Mohan, who is our new director uh, of ISAS. He has got a tremendous CV and uh, he writes so, he's such a prolific writer. Today there's an article on, uh, on, Imran, uh, on Pakistan's change in Imran Khan's, uh, uh, you know, interesting uh, history. And uh, if you <coughs> look at Indian papers, Singapore papers, US papers, <coughs> almost two or three times a week there have been article by Raja Mohan. So I'm very happy you joined us and I welcome you. And he will be chairing this session as the <coughs> moderator. Thank you very much. It's also related, I believe, the trade wars today, 
uh, to the technological disruption that is taking place uh, in the world economy. That the question of technology uh, is one of the central themes of the US-China trade war today. And a lot of it is focused on uh, not just the <coughs> deficit numbers, but the kind of uh, China's uh, strategy on technological development and what it does to uh, the US primacy uh, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the technological arena that, that we've seen so far. So I think it's uh, quite a sweeping set of issues involved. I think uh, we have uh, the four panelists here we're going to talk about, uh, talk about this. But I also want, uh, before I start inviting them, uh, just one other thought I wanted to leave with you, which is that there is a danger of groupthink when we debate on these issues. Because many of us, believe liberal international order is good, liberal trading regime is good. But I think the intellectual challenge is going to be to deal with those who are questioning the premises of the liberal international order and those who ask, what has it done for me lately? Uh, if you're from West Virginia, if you're from Michigan, if you're from these kind of places, people are asking those questions and they have a political voice. So there's going to be uh, consequences to uh, those who raise these questions of what this order uh, is doing so. So I would say, uh, if somebody, everyone talks about Trump's protectionism. Uh, I saw some commentary recently which talked about Trump is actually forcing a new, even more liberal international order: zero tariffs, zero non-tariff barriers, and zero subsidies. Uh, imagine. I, I don't know if we can get to that word, but uh, quite clearly, at least, is putting an ideologically is putting an argument. Uh, that's quite challenging. Uh, I think part of our struggle would be to intellectually to come to terms with this. A very difficult a moment in our global politics at this point of time. So I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Lee, Chairman Lee. Well, uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Prof. Mohan, for uh, allowing me to speak first. Uh, let me also thank uh, Ambassador Bukina Pile for recounting our friendship. Really, it went back uh, almost two decades. Huh? Uh, you know, when we were much younger. Uh, but. <laughs> Mahathir coming into power, I think that's true, we are very young again. <laughs> so I think my perspective has changed. Uh, I figure that in my next 40 years, like before I retire at 95, like him, uh, I can probably do another three more PhDs. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm really a privilege uh, to, to join uh, all the distinguished speakers and, and all of you here. Uh, like Prof Mohan, I'm not a trade specialist either. So uh, this, this subject is really uh, of, of uh, great uh, curiosity to me. For today's discussion, I thought I'd uh, speak on you know, a couple of points under various topics. First is, of course, the state of trade today. Uh, it all started on the 1st March when the President Trump uh, signaled his uh, intention to you know, impose tariff on the Chinese export of steel and aluminum. And uh, you know, a month later, 2nd April, not 1st April, I think the Chinese have to appreciate that 1st April could be taken as a April first joke. Uh, so, first, on the 2nd April, Beijing imposed tariffs again, um, about the same amount of uh, American exports, uh, which was about 2.4 2.4 billion. And uh, uh, it was targeted at uh, you know, uh, pork and uh, agricultural products. And then, of course, the next day, we all learned that President Trump announced uh, through 50 billion, uh, first is 50 billion worth of goods. So this time round, it covers a bit more uh, on the semi-finished products, semiconductors, <coughs> medical devices, flat screen televisions. And then, of course, the deep impact went on. The Chinese uh, came up with uh, a list of 106 American goods including soybeans, cars, and airplanes. Now, soybeans is interesting because uh, in the uh, Chinese purchase of American agricultural products, half of which is made up of soybeans. And soybeans came from uh, states that supported President Trump, eight of ten states, like Iowa, Nebraska, Indiana, Missouri, Ohio, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Kansas. Right, so, so the Chinese knew where to uh, apply pressure. And then, of course, uh, on the 15th June, uh, uh, Trump announced another 200 billion worth of uh, 
Chinese imports to be targeted. Of course, all this will take time to implement because uh, you know they typically go through uh, periods of uh, consultation with the industry, and uh, you know so so uh, the next uh, real uh, implementation of these two hundred million will probably come into effect after September. Um, American perspectives. I think there are, there are many, many of you are familiar with American perspectives. Um, I think President Trump uh, has to honor his campaign promise, has to put America first. Um, I think he specifically took issues with uh, you know, uh, America's trading partners in three areas. One is state subsidy, the other one is uh, a level playing field, this is regulations and so on. The third one, of course, uh, specific to China, is Chinese uh, technological plan made in China in 2025. Now, on the first two, in terms of state subsidy and unlevel playing field, uh, some analysts have argued that the WTO as it is today is not very effective in handling uh, opaque regulations or practices. They are good at what is announced and published, but they are not good at handling complaints against uh, published, uh, unpublished uh, practices. So I think President Trump's, uh, one of his objective of this trade war is to, is to get to the root of these practices. The other, uh, the other perspective of the trade war from the American point of view is of course uh, the containment of China uh, of its rising, you know, uh, technological progress. Because you know, we all know that in China, if you are technology firms, very often you have to uh, trade off uh, technology uh, with the market share. You have to. We are forced into joint venture, and you have to do some form of technological technology transfer. So if not, you can stay on the sideline and wait for the time when Chinese opens is uh, the particular sector. Uh, of course, uh, we 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 all know that uh, a trade war like this, even from the American perspective. Uh, there will be this double edged sword. It will hurt the Chinese first, but it will also hurt American firms uh, heavily invested in China or has its distribution uh, supply chain uh, distributed across uh, China and, and Southeast Asia. So, a good example would be like Apple. Apple has got 200 over subcontractors, and they in turn own 900 over manufacturing plants. And out of the 900 manufacturing plants, about 538 are located in China. And then there are about 107, 137 in Japan and 64 in the United States. So when you when you effect a trade war like this, you, you first hurt their companies and secondly your farmers and then third your, your technology companies which are you know have their global uh, supply chain. Um, then what about the Chinese? What, what do they think? So, uh, in our interactions and our reading of Chinese uh, reports, uh, in China itself, it's very hard to take an otherwise position because the media censorship is pretty strong. So, so if you are commercial trade magazines and so on, you have to find reasons to say why uh, this trade war is, is bad for China, is uh, ill-motivated. Uh, but there is quite a big uh, group of people that argue that uh, China can break through this trade war. And there are several reasons. Uh, one is that uh, China, Chinese economy uh, has evolved. And uh, for example, in the first quarter of this year, uh, three quarter of the GDP growth was driven by consumption. And consumption at the whole GDP level is about 16%. So in other words, they are they are they are coming along. They, they consumption, you know, domestic consumption is taking up more and more uh, uh, part of the GDP. They're driving GDP more. 
uh, of course, compared to developed countries, which is at 80%, there is still uh, uh, you know, a distance to go. And secondly, China has got, uh, uh, China possibly could repeat uh, its uh, uh, money easing policy. So you recall after the 2008 financial crisis, uh, Chinese has pumped in 4 trillion worth of RMB, that's about 600 billion. And, uh, and, and it could do the same, you know, to stimulate the economy by infrastructure investments and so on. But this argument has got some shortcoming. Because after the 19th Congress uh, last year, uh, one of the clear strategies identified by uh, Mr. Lee the economic advisor to, uh, uh, to Xi Jinping, is to deleverage, is to uh, accelerate the deleveraging, uh, remove excess capacity, uh, uh, remove inventory, remove supply side, you know. Uh, Imbalances, so to speak. So, on one hand, you want to reform, but now when they see that uh, the trade war is imminent and Chinese economy is going down, they have no choice but to pop up the economy again by pumping in uh, more liquidity. Um, of course, uh, there are the, there are other uh, uh, real. Um, uh, fundamentals that uh, you know will argue for uh, Chinese uh, continued progress. For example, uh, China invests a lot in R and D. They are very consistent uh, in their university budget. Uh, they filed uh, forty-seven thousand patents last year compared to America fifty-three thousand, but they are filing at a much faster rate. Even though their rate of commercialization of the patent is still quite low. Into this term, but they believe that they will catch up one day. And uh, like uh, Prof Mohan said, uh, the trade war has got implications for both Trump and for C. Uh, for C, of course, he has got this uh, plan to build, to make China into a moderately developed country by 2035, and by and to become a superpower uh, by 2050. All right, so. So continual progress and stability uh, in the system is of utmost importance. So, so with that kind of perspective uh, in mind, uh, China would want to uh, find ways to avoid a trade war. Because uh, if it is denied uh, the market that has, got, that has supported this growth for the last 30 years of reform, uh, you know, they will know that their ambition to become, uh, to reach these targets in 2035, 2050 will be considerably uh, slow. In terms of the impacts of the region, regional economy, of course now you can hear, you can read about headlines about firms cutting down uh, or suspending their investment plans in China as well as in the US. Uh, some firms are reported to suspend hiring because they're not sure uh, whether they, they could go on the original business plan. Uh, and there are impacts on stock market. Uh, you know, stock market has been down in throughout Asia. Uh, in, in, in the US, it's still holding up. Uh, and there are economies that estimate that uh, the GDP, you know, as it pans out, if we have an all out trade war, as has been announced, uh, both China and US will suffer. Uh, a quarter percent drop in GDP. <coughs> but for other support developing, for other uh, smaller Asian countries, like Ambassador has said, uh, we are in bigger trouble because Singapore will suffer something like 0 0.8 percent this year and 1.5 percent next year. So considering we only have 3 3 percent to grow, so if you half our growth rate, and that is very uh, you know significant for us. So I will pause there, and I, I think what, what I've discussed is uh, the, you know, the American perspective, the Chinese perspective, the impact on the regional economy, the impact on perhaps WTO and Singapore. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Uh, thanks for putting it in such elegantly simple terms so than I could understand but, uh, some of the major issues that you pointed out. So now we want to move on to Mr. Watson. Fifteen minutes. Yeah.
Thank you. I'll, I'll keep my uh, remarks a little bit more uh, brief. My name is Dustin Watson. I'm director of the Asian Business Trade Association. Uh, and by the organization name, you would also think that I'm a trade expert. And being the third in a row now, I am not. <laughs> uh, I do come to the table with 25 years of government affairs experience, the most recent 16 in Washington, D.C. So I have a sense of how Washington works, less of a sense of how this administration is working. Uh, but I think most people in the U.S. and globally uh, would agree with that sentiment as well. And specifically, I can share that just about one year ago, uh, when I was working for the American Chamber of Commerce here in Singapore, representing business interests before the U.S. government at the time, when we were deployed into Washington, D.C. to lobby for a week, uh, we had a series of meetings with the House of Representatives, with the Senate, uh, with think tank leaders, with media, uh, with uh, other chamber-related organizations, other businesses, lobby groups, uh, and uh, administration officials. Uh, a year ago at this time, a lot of people were scratching their heads and, and doing much of the same as what we're doing now, and that is trying to figure out the next moves and how the administration plans to move forward, uh, be it with trade or with other, with other policy. Um, with that understanding, um, I think moving forward, what people have to um, really consider is less about the policies as it relates to trade in the context of trying to figure out next steps and what is really motivating the administration. Um, the opening remarks really refer to trade being about politics. And that is really the lens that I will be speaking through today. It is really about politics. Um, when Mr. Uh, Trump won the election, he pulled off the biggest political coup in US history. He began his career as a politician when he was on the campaign trail and when he was elected to public office for the first time as the United States President. And that says a lot. That was the beginning of what I saw as somebody who was developing into an expert politician. Put the policies aside, whether you agree with where he's going on trade or other issues, um, he is turning out to be an outstanding politician. Now as it relates to trade and his next moves, Think along the lines of the political spectrum. His eyes are really set on the midterm elections. He is the head of the Republican Party. And his presidency right now really rests on attempting to maintain the House and certainly to maintain the Republican majority in the Senate. At this point, he could pull off yet another political coup. Uh, as U.S. history goes, during the first term of the U.S. presidency, at that midterm point, one chamber or both will usually go majority to the other party. We are, we are a few months away from those midterms. And his polling right now with the Republican Party is through the roof. As a public relations expert and connected to being a politician, he is in the news every single day. He is headline news almost every hour. Everybody's watching Twitter accounts. And this is in recognition of where his base is turning. His base of Republican support is enormous. And given that, that lends credence to where he is at on the trade policies. He will continue to go down this path of what he believes and has stated, it is a trade war. We've been at it for a long time and the U.S. has been losing. We're not on the cusp of a trade war. It's not about to happen. It's not imminent. It's already here. And the U.S. has been losing and 
I'm the U.S. president right now, and my support is it's backing me. As he turns into the midterm elections in November, keep that in mind as the trade rhetoric increases. I don't see it. I don't see it subsiding any time before November. I only see it increasing over time. Uh, with that said, again, he could pull off another political coup and maintain the House of Representatives. By maintaining the House of Representatives, any thought or notion of any impeachment proceedings is really put quiet. Certainly with the Senate, which would be the judge and jury through any, proceed, any impeachment proceedings, uh, maintaining it wouldn't have a chance at all. So as it relates to trade, as it relates to other policies, as long as he's getting support from his Republican base and the polling is through the roof, he will continue down this line of maintaining bilateral trade opportunities and going along with the tariffs right through the midterms. What happens after the midterms, everybody can speculate. There, there's already clear indications that um, some pain would be felt from, from U.S. farmers. We talked about soybeans. Um, I don't think it's going to be uh, um, as painful as people think it will be given that future contracts are already in place for the soybean farmers. There's talk of manufacturing hits, there's talk of uh, fisheries, ranchers being hurt. The big terms are just a few months away, and unless those voices are raised at a very high level, uh, which I don't see happening, they're just beginning to bubble up now, uh, I believe that the rhetoric on trade will continue. If he maintains the House, if he maintains the Senate, there may be a cooling off period. But again, that is speculation and only time to tell. As director of the Asia Business Trade Association, we are trying to bring businesses large and small together Asia-wide. We believe we are the only trade association in the space doing it. And we're trying to build a bridge between government and business as it relates to trade. So as an association here in Asia, we will continue to promote the trade deal, such as the CPTPP and RCEP. We will continue to work on next generation of trade issues, FinTech, e-commerce, cross-border data flows. And we will continue to build the voice of small business at just five months old, the Asia Business Trade Association now has over 1,000 members. Many of those are small businesses because governments in Asia want to hear from small business in particular. With that said, we have a growing number of multinational corporations, American, European, and Asia, that are coming to join us as well to promote these trade deals. So regardless of where tariffs are at between China and the U.S., regardless of what the U.S. administration is doing on trade policy, there is a business voice here in Asia that will continue to promote multilateral trade. In sum, I would say, let's get through the midterms, and then let's talk again and see where U.S. policy is at. Thank you. Hello very much. It's quite, uh, quite miraculous that how do you turn a party like the Republican Party, the party of free traders, into supporting the president's uh, policies against trade. So, so I think that tells us something about the extraordinary tumult in the domestic politics of the, of the United States. Some of it was visible, and I think, during the campaign when Bernie Sanders' uh, positions were not very different. And today, we have the so-called Democratic Socialist Association uh, you know, pushing the mainstream democratic establishment, which otherwise should have been championing the workers' cause, actually is a free trade liberal international order stuff. Well, actually, 
uh, the traditional constituencies of a democratic party could actually be moving in the uh, other direction, uh, which is to uh, the AFL-CIO, many of the labor organizations, uh, their hostility to, expected hostility to Trump, we don't know how that's going to play out, there's already some decline in that. So I think it's really a truly uh, important political moment uh, in the United States, I think, uh, which we need to uh, keep in mind. So thank you, thank you for that. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Mr. Petrosa from the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council. When APEC was formed, uh, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, is one organization without a noun. Is it, what is it, a forum, a council, a society? <laughs> but uh, the PCC, uh, which is a business affiliate of that, is very much involved. And I think uh, one of the biggest effects of the current trade war is on the Asia Pacific region. And uh, you will give us some insights for the other places. Well, well, thank you very much. It's a great uh, honor to, to be here. I, I wonder if I can get away with being the fourth person to say that he's not a trade expert. I, I don't think I can get away with that, but uh, I'll try my, my very best. I, if I was going to describe myself in this context, it would be I just work next door. So it was very easy to be here. <laughs> I, I also say that this, thank you so much to the ISAS for this opportunity to, to fulfill one of my key performance indicators. Uh, being in Singapore is one of the points about us all being in this cluster is that we develop the synergies between our, our work programs and I think this kind of event really does help us to understand the broader region and what's happening amongst the different stakeholders in the global Asia Pacific region. I, I will be speaking from the perspective of the Pacific Economic Cooperation Council. I do have a noun. Um, we predate APEC by, by, by nine years. Uh, so we, we sort of act in an advisory role and we try and understand the big trends um, in the region. So one of the things that we do every year is a survey of what we call opinion leaders or some other adjective that I think might get resonance in, in the media or take uh, advice on what actually does have resonance. But the point I wanted to make in showing you this slide is that in fact when we did this survey last year, we asked the question, what are your expectations for global growth over the next 12 months? And in spite of all the rhetoric that we heard, this was, they were the most optimistic they've been since the immediate bounce back from the global financial crisis. And that's important to remember. We're still in that, in that space. Global economic growth is pretty good. Um, aside from the corrections we're seeing in the asset markets, if you think about where, for example, the Dow was immediately after the financial crisis, about 5,000, whatever it dropped to, it's now 24,000. That's a remarkable. You know, increase in, in wealth, if you like it. I guess going back to that theme we've been here, it's not wealth in everyone, it's wealth in a few people's pockets, and perhaps that explains the political economy of what's behind um, these things. But that's, that's one point, but there's a disconnect here, and that's a word I'm going to use a lot in this presentation, if I, if I remember, I don't get carried away with myself. There are disconnects here. Um, here. Here's one disconnect that I like. In the history of the Asia Pacific, we like to say that Asia, at least, um, Trade has been a driver of growth. We've had export-driven growth in the Asia Pacific for the last 30 to 40 years, starting with Japan, then to the NIEs, ASEAN, and finally um, China. Since the GFC, if you look at those little bars that at the end since 2008, uh, that's, that's the difference between overall growth and aggregate demand and, and exports. And you can see before the GFC, it was pretty big. That was a big, big differential. And now it's almost growing in line with overall aggregate demand. And that perhaps speaks to some of the changes that we're seeing in the region as well uh, that Mr. Lee uh, referred, referred to in that we're seeing much greater domestic demand, especially consumption growth in Asia. So, so while the overall commentary of people like us, we're pretty negative, yeah, some happy people for now. Uh, another question we ask in our survey is, what do you think are the top risks to growth for your economy over the next year? the years. And amazingly and surprisingly, perhaps unsurprisingly, the top risk to growth last year was increased protectionism. And we hear a bit, it's almost shrill the words that you pick up the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, you watch CNBC today. Everything's about the trade war and growing protectionism. And I, I, I just can't reconcile it. I have a very hard time reconciling that the noise we make about increased protectionism and risks for this, and these amazing stock market prices and growth numbers we're seeing. Is there a lag? What's, what's missing? Well, that's, that's the disconnect that I, that I refer to. I, I, I look at this, and we, we do this survey every year, and you see an enormous uptick in the percentage 
of respondents who picked protectionism as a risk to vote. So that's a more stubborn angle for the two of you. That really does worry me. I do care deeply about free trade and integration and globalization. I do think it leads to, to better uh, outcomes, but um, we see this risk um, increasing, and perhaps it's, there's a lag in these numbers. We won't see the impact on overall incomes for a while. Perhaps we will. Uh, I'm, I'm very worried about this, though. The World Bank and IMF are pretty somewhat laying, and it's pretty, it's pretty scary, especially for open economies. Um, like Singapore. Um, here, here's, here's some numbers that, that, I, that I rather like that I've been using every now and then. Uh, trade restricting measures since the GFC by Asia Pacific economies since the global financial crisis. Um, so, so the numbers you get on an, on an annual basis, you get about 400 trade restricting measures. So, so when Dustin said that, you know, that I think you were sort of channeling your Mr. Trump uh, and, and his take on the trade war. Well, it's been going on for a while. This is not new. It didn't really, I mean, yes, the big tariff moves from the US and, and, and the actions against them did start in the last six months. But as you can see from this chart, we've been doing a lot of naughty things. I think let's, let's, let's have a little bit of honesty about that, that there have been trade restricting measures that have been put in place since the global financial crisis. And this is in spite of, um, oh my, my emoji doesn't, doesn't want to yeah. uh, I have a lovely emoji of Quizzically, <laughs> this is a quote from the G20, I think the first G20 summit, where it says something to the extent of, we will restrain from trade restricting measures, we won't do any of those things. And that's why I had a physical emoji, wondering, what's, what's going on? Here's another disconnect between the rhetoric that we use and the actual things that we see. And what, what are those things? So we've, we've talked a lot about tariffs, we've talked about the steel, aluminium, and the counterfeit. But there are other things that have been happening. You, you can't possibly read this, and I can no longer read the font sizes. I, I, I cheat by, by just making the font smaller rather than being able to actually select any uh, information. But the top uh, favored, most favored trade restricting measure adopted by Asia regional economies is anti dumping. Uh, import tariffs have come up um, in a pretty big way, but there are many, many others. So financial grants, trade finance, and, and I think something I'm attending will come to. There's also labor market access um, issues that have come into it. So none of us are without sin, I think, uh, is it something I'd probably say. Um, what's the overall impact? Of, we don't, it's hard to calculate these things. Here, here's, here's another number from the Global Trade Alert. So according to these guys, about 74% of G20 exports have been exposed to some type of trade distortion since 2008. That's an awfully large number given that G20 leaders have said they're going to refrain from doing anything of that kind. So I just put that as, as context that, that this has been simmering, if you like, uh, for a while. So sort of more broadly, what's happening in, in, in the world, we hear a lot about global value chains and global supply chains. We, we heard that story from somebody about the way Apple conducts itself and has 900 suppliers, supply factories around the world. The light blue line on top, uh, sales of foreign affiliates. So if you like, this is the activities of multinationals like Apple and, and, and others in there. And the dark blue line below that are exports of goods and services. Now, all I want to demonstrate to you is that these two numbers moved in lockstep all the way from the very beginning, number 1990, all the way through to about 2030. And then you see a kind of inflection point where sales of foreign affiliates of multinationals continue to rise much, quite strongly in this post GFC recovery. But exports of goods and stuff are going to flat. The question I ask is, is the business model changing? Are we seeing some kind of more localization? Are, are the big companies deciding to do more manufacturing closer to the markets? Is this a result of some of the trade policy actions that we've seen? I think of the very big announced uh, Foxconn investment um, into India, uh, and I wonder to myself, what's that for? Um, is it to service the, the very big Indian market? Is it to integrate um, India into the regional value uh, networks that, that Apple operates and so on? And of course, we have heard very recently another very large Foxconn um, investment in the United States. Which market is that for? I, I took the further to ask them on some of those questions. But this entire context leads us to the sort of political economy 
political environment issue. And so we, we, we've started asking this question. What's your assessment of the political environment for free trade in the region? And we felt obliged to put this in because we are very guilty of using uh, CGE models, let's say, the TPP model, the X trillion dollars of global GDP and RCEP model, X trillion dollars and so on. But we wanted to, to have something to balance that against this one. Are we going to be able to achieve any of these things that we talk about um, in the region? Uh, very worryingly, overall, what you see there is we've got a negative 52%. So 52% had a negative assessment of the political environment for free, for free trade, and only 26% had a positive um, assessment. But as we look, we break that down across the sub-regions of the Asia Pacific, and what we see is pretty much everyone is negative. We, we don't ask follow-up questions of why are you negative. If I invoke uh, Raj's sort of polar broad line of what have you done to me lately, it's, it's pretty important to think how have these things played out in people's mind. So have they, do they feel they feel the benefits? But that said, let me come to another disconnect. When we ask, so bear in mind that fact that we think there's a negative political environment for fear trade. When we ask, when will the RCEP be completed? You know, this is the regional comprehensive economic partnership which will bring ASEAN together with its, with its bilateral trading partners with you. It has an FTA. A whopping 65% said, well, within the next two to five years. I'll be unrealistic optimistic in the Asia-Pacific region. But that said, 65% think it's going to happen. So there's a disconnect in this number. Uh, we asked the same question about the TPP 11, or CPTPP, I must say, from the our Canadian um, friends. Only 10% said within one year, and 49% said within the next two to five years. So again, a, this, a disconnect, we've got this completely wrong, because it has been completed. Uh, so well done, all of you. Uh, what does this leave, I guess, trying to transition a little bit into, into, into Amit Hendu's uh, piece? This is a picture that I rather like of the Asia-Pacific trade architecture, that we like big words. <laughs> and we see an evolving architecture here. So, uh, I don't know if you can see this at all, and my eyesight's getting worse and worse uh, as, I, as, I, as I age and I'm no longer a millennial. Uh, but you have the you have the, the light sort of blue box at APEC members, and that's the basic footprint that we look at. But the CPT, it's transversal, it includes uh, many different players. We have the CJK, which is sometimes happening and sometimes not between China, Japan, and Korea. Of course, we have ASEAN, the AEC, and like the center, a bunch of this, the NAFTA, which is either on or off. But it's been around for a while, it's one of the first ones. Um, and RCEP being sort of dotted red line around there. And you see India in this sort of yellow box over there, not terribly densely covered by these trading trade agreements. Um, I, I, I'm a born multilateralist, so I look at these things sometimes and I, and I stop a little bit, but there's a little bit of a pragmatist and realist about me. And if I was back in government, I'd probably might be advising whichever government I was advising. You want as dense coverage as possible. In, in a world of value change, you are facing preference coercion. If you, if you want to be part of these value chains, you want as low and minimal tariffs as possible, so that as you live in this value chain world, your products are not subject to even these very small tariffs on average, three and a half percent or so. But that's still a nuisance tariff when, when your products cross borders many, many, many times. Uh, I'll try and come to a conclusion, but we've talked a little bit about the multilateral trading system. I gave you a quote from the G20. APEC has similar statements. So every year we ask opinion leaders, stakeholders, some kind of question about the WTO or the multilateral trading system, the Doha round, something. Words, words to that extent. It changes from year to year depending on what's, what's happening in the world. In 2007, when we started this, 48% of business respondents, not everyone, just I've just taken up business people, had some kind of WTO issue as a, as a top five priority for regional leaders to talk about when they meet at the APEC leaders meeting. Over the course of that, those 10 years, that's dropped to 11.3% last year, 4.7% the year before. That's a very, very low percentage, and it puts WTO in the multilateral trading system about 20th in the list of 25 priorities that we look at. This is incredibly worrying for me, as I said, I'm a, I'm a multilateralist by, 
by nature. So it concerns me that the key stakeholders in the trading system don't have the WTO or the NTS, if you like, um, front and center of, of their thinking. And again, this is another disconnect. I, I was at a speech given by uh, Canada's foreign minister uh, this morning, and, and she uh, dropped something that I thought was incredibly important. We have overplayed, I think, the negotiating mandate of the WTO. So we, we tend to equate the WTO and multilateral trading system with negotiating that. Is this Doha going to happen? When is it going to happen? Is it important? And so on. But we've forgotten about the very important dispute settlement mechanism and the dispute settlement role that it plays as an impartial arbiter on trade disputes. So I think if we're going to succeed in getting through this trade war and thinking through what the system needs to look at, we need to put that quite center in our thinking about how do we make this system fair, how do we make it inclusive, and how do we make it relevant to, to modern businesses. And that speaks back to the earlier slide that I showed you on the kinds of trade restricting measures uh, that economies in the region have been using. Um, Conclusions. Um, trade tensions have been taking place against the rather benign economic context. Those of you who have heard me speak before have heard me rant and rave like a Cassandra, wondering when this is all going to collapse uh, horribly. Uh, protections of the growth have been rising. I don't know if this is a peak, uh, but perhaps we'll see uh, when we do the survey again this year. Trade is no longer the driver of growth it used to be, but it's still very, very important, I think, for job creation, competitiveness and moving up the value chain. So don't, that, don't take that slide ahead um, out of context. Uh, everyone's been uh, implementing trade uh, restrictive uh, measures in spite of the very nice political statements that, that we've been making against them. Business models are changing, and I think we need to understand them and understand how trade policy impacts those business models. Uh, regionalism, it's going to continue. Um, I, 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 I wanted to click back very quickly to this slide. And just this funny thing um, that's a diagonal effect. Um, that's the Pacific Alliance and its negotiations with associate members, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. There's an awful lot of momentum towards trade liberalization that continues in spite of the rhetoric that we're seeing. And unless we're getting into that game, it's um, my way of transitioning to contender, I think you might be in a bit of trouble in getting access. Um, two markets. But I still think we should keep the multilateral trading system and WTO center in our thoughts and wonder how all of those regional efforts fit into the broader multilateral discussion. So that's, that's my spiel for today. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone for the point about the multiple disconnects. I think it's uh, always good to just go below the headline and uh, the complexity of uh, actually what is happening and the gap between rhetoric and clearly in the facts, uh, I think uh, gives a pause you know, the bigger challenge of keeping alive the, the multilateral idea of progress, not just to play up and Thank you so much, and uh, unfortunately, I, I cannot get away by saying that I'm not a trade expert. <laughs> but honestly, I'm not. I mean, I follow trade. So, but the current state of trade is something which requires a very different kind of expertise. So, I don't really think I have that. So, what I'll do is that just to uh, build up on uh, the extremely rich variety of insights that have come from my uh, previous speakers, I, I'll confine my observations to India in this context. Now, uh, it, th this was a bit surprising and probably not expected by many that India actually, if one can describe it that way, officially joined the trade war. Officially joined the trade war by announcing its uh, decision to impose retaliatory tariffs on 29 items uh, that it imports from the US. Uh, the tariffs are yet to become operational. They are supposed to become operational within less than 48 hours. But if one uh, can, can sort of uh, pay some credence to the news that is coming in, is that there are still hectic negotiations going on bilaterally between India and the US trade negotiators who see that if some way can be found out from the larger mess. But uh, well, as of now, uh, it, it doesn't seem very likely. So uh, 4th of August, uh, these Indian tariffs should become effective on uh, imports, covering roughly around $240 million. 
Now the point is, uh, let, let, let me just begin uh, my thoughts on this. Why did India retaliate? And why do I say this? I say this because that if one goes back to the steel and aluminium tariffs in post twenty years, in early April, these actually were not country specific, these were product specific, and affected the majority of steel and aluminium exporters into the United States. And let's note this point that India is not among the top 10 steel and aluminium exporters into the US. And let's also note the point that there are countries among this top 10 which have not taken the damaging action. Japan hasn't, <coughs> Korea hasn't, <coughs> Brazil hasn't. So why did India retaliate? That is perhaps more a mystery and uh, require another, another uh, session to look at that. But having retaliated, and incidentally, the retaliatory tariffs came later, but many uh, probably don't uh, have noticed this. China was the first country to get the US into WTO on disputes against the tariffs that it imposed. And India was the first country to join China within 12 days of China bringing this notice in the disputes that we began. So when that was followed by Russia, Norway, Mexico, and a number of other countries. Now, steel and aluminium are of course not major exports, but the way matters stand now, if India does go ahead with the retail trade tariffs that it has announced in another 48 hours. What happens after that? What are the impacts? Well, uh, the impacts can be many, but let's look at this in a little bit of a context. And the context is very simply this, that India and the US, uh, in very simplistically put, are worlds apart when it comes to trade. Now, that does not mean that trade between them doesn't work. Over the last 16 years, bilateral trade between India and the uh, US has grown rapidly. In, in 2000, it was just around $19 billion. By 2016, it has become $115 billion. Certainly not as large as almost a trillion dollar of the US-EU trade. Not as large as the $650 billion of US-China trade. Also less than... Uh, around $300 billion of the US Japan trade, but $115 billion is not a small amount. So this trade has grown in spite of both countries having a rather rocky relationship. They, they quarrel with each other on trade. They have been among the first countries to take each other to dispute right after the WTO came into play. Within three months of the WTO coming into play, India and the US took each other to dispute. And then it has continued, and they have filed between them almost 20 dispute cases. Now, the issue over here is that this is a context, I think, which needs to be kept in the larger uh, framework that we are discussing. That there is a certain degree of discomfort, there is a certain degree of resistance and defensiveness when it comes to each other's perspectives on trade. And that will continue to be a factor in whatever happens from now on. And what can happen from now on? Well, this is where I think I'll just kind of build up on a couple of points which Dustin and Ed said. Now, let's look at the short-term impact. Short-term impact is trade war continues, prolongs, intensifies. And the US starts thinking of taking more and more actions which are specific to India. What would be those? Now, before I come to that, let me share with you an interesting point. India is a unique trade partner of the US from a US perspective. Why is it so? Look, US runs very large trade deficits with its major trade partners. It does so with India. But India is the only country with whom it runs a deficit in services trade. With all other countries, it runs a deficit in goods trade, but a surplus in services trade. India is the only country with whom it runs deficits in both goods and services trade. And this brings in a new dimension to the story. Now, in this context, let's just look at the larger scheme of things. What happens if there are now certain further actions coming out from the US? One very likely action, 
And this is where, in fact, I'll just like to allude to the fact that steel and aluminum tariffs don't really hit India exports to the US much. But what might hit India badly is if the Section 232 investigations by the US on auto parts and components are actually implemented. Implemented into higher tariffs because the major Indian exports to the US are diamonds, jewelry, seafood, medicine, auto parts, aero parts. So if the auto part tariffs become generic, a certain chunk of important Indian exports to the US get hit. Now let's Let's combine this with the US intention, hypothetical intention, to teach India a lesson right, on the retail tariffs. And on the good side, what might happen? India's GSP access into the US is not applicable anymore. For about a year or a few more, it's gone. It's, it's, it's still being reviewed whether India qualifies as a GSP eligible country. And for all practical purposes, it's not going to come unless and until there is a quid pro quo. And the quid pro quo could amount to the US demanding India, giving it greater access in certain areas, which in India are now relatively closed. And this is just not Harley Davidson motorbikes. I think the US pressure on India will essentially be to open up the dairy and agriculture, <coughs> which with Indian elections 10 months away, I can leave that to further discussion. How easy, how difficult will it be for India to establish to an Octavian agriculture? And there would be other demands, like say, for example, don't impose price caps on medical devices and similar equipment, greater market access. Because it's important for the US to shift a part of the exports that it is getting blocked in other markets into alternative markets. And India is a big market. So some further access is necessary. Now, if this is a condition, the other condition would be that, look, we, we stay away from taking further action against you, provided, and this is a view which is coming up in several discussions, provided, India decides to put voluntary restraints on its steel and aluminum exports into the US. <coughs> Now, this is not clear about how exactly this can work out, but voluntary exports are part of the entire safeguards we can the whole trade political problems in that work. But I would like to draw your attention to another very different arena of possible actions, and this is where I want to come back to the point that I made a little while earlier that the US runs a services trade deficit of India. Now, Let's look at this a little bit clearly. The US's intrinsic trade advantages are in services across the world. In this respect, India is a complicated country. Because India does have comparative advantages in certain areas of services, which has got reflected in its bilateral trade relation. So what does that mean? I sense three categories of action. And when I say three categories of action, I am perfectly mindful of the fact that section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962 gives the President of the United States of America enormous powers to control trade on national security grounds. And this is where it talked about multilateralism, but the problem is multilateralism becomes a dead duck in this case because the Article 21 of the Act allows all countries to act on national security interest. And it was the least discussed article of the WTO which has suddenly become most active. Countries across the world realize, yes, the WTO can't stop us if you stop trade on national security grounds. Now, the point over here is that national security as a trade blockage and trade action method has already been implemented by the US to the extent that the US has argued, and this is where it's perfectly correct on the legal ground. The US has actually argued that countries which have retaliated against us on the tariffs that we have brought up are wrong because on national interest, whatever we do cannot be retaliated against. So it has actually gone ahead and filed counter retaliatory measures. And there is some hope that India is still not a part of that counter retaliatory group. Might become after another 48 hours. Who knows? But what are these possible actions? If one is imaginative, if one looks at the India-US trade relation, if one 
suspects that the US is increasingly threatened by India as a potential market travel in services. So there's no logical reason why Section 232 cannot be extended to H1B. It's also a national security threat. And the H1B has increasingly been tightened. The last four disputes that India has taken at the WTO on the US is on each one. Price caps, higher visas, visa delays. It can, it can well be taken because if one looks carefully at the White House report on China that has come out, there are direct and indirect allusions to Section 232 everywhere in that, in that entire report. So H1B, one source of action. The second, India and the US have had this major, major issue over food security measures. Now, India can't stop increasing the minimum support prices for its food grains. And it is creating a big hole for itself in the WTO because it has gone way beyond its permissible level of market support. And it is becoming a victim in that respect because there is not a single case that India has won at the WTO till now on this, and there is not a single case that the US has lost. It's a different matter that the US lawyers only argue against the US when other countries engage in that WTO, showing the great strength of the US legal community. But that's how uh, sort of the reality is. The third point Special 301 USDR. India remains on the priority watch list as one of those countries where IP protection and enforcement is rather, rather poor. It's a different matter that China also remains on that, Russia also remains on that. But that China and Russia are very different stories. And India remains on this, and China and Russia don't run services straight surpluses with the US, which India does. And a final point, I think Ed brought this up. I have a feeling the trade war is just beginning, in the sense that it's not going to remain confined to tariffs. <coughs> It started well before this latest round came, which is just tariffs, and it's going to widen, which is pretty well visible from the actions that the US has started taking on China. So if that happens, then there are some areas where India becomes a contender for action, and one of these is actually data. Data standards in the US, uh, in India, locally are moving in a direction which is completely opposite to the kind of data standards that the US would like to bring. Because India is going for data localization. India is going for far greater privacy enforcement than its content. And over time, this is likely to become a very major point of contention because much of India's commercial space in a large respect has been now taken over by American companies and interests get hurt. So, to put it in a last bit of a perspective, I think I'll end by saying that it's no more a question of just tariffs. The war, if it continues, is going to get much bigger, wider. There are studies that are beginning to come out quantifying the losses that countries are going to face. There are some studies that have come out for four major economies of South Asia as well. Just on a tariff segment, I think India and Sri Lanka stand to be hit the most. But in India's case, given its very specific character of trade relations with India, the hit will be harder, longer, and deeper. Thanks, uh, thanks, Anthony. Thanks, uh, <laughs> I think uh, most of you know that India is a prickly trade partner. I mean, uh, that's not news. Uh, it's not just the US that anyone has been negotiating with India has a problem. I think India has had the advantage so far. The rest of the world was liberalized. I mean, India could be the one take its time, how new, and be a scrappy player. But I think the fundamental change that has taken place uh, in the United States, I think uh, uh, India as much as even more than any all the other actors uh, have to come to terms with. Sure. And uh, that's going to be a huge uh, challenge for India. I think that in an election year, where the, even the limited space for reform is shrinking, uh, it's going to be uh, quite, a, quite a dangerous turn for India. So 25 years after reform, I think, you have to make a judgment. How is it going to deal with the rest of the world? And posturing for domestic audiences uh, will be could turn out to be rather costly uh, given the external circumstances. That are. But I, I will stop here. The floor is open now. Uh, please feel free to introduce yourself and then ask for short, uh, short questions to panelists.